Um, good afternoon, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ludmila, and I'm happy to uh, welcome you uh, uh, in our webinar, Embracing Indigenous Perspective to Achieve Sustainable Development Goals. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, say Happy International World Indigenous People Day. And I think the most, uh, the best way to celebrate it is to talk about it, to make people aware of uh, the, the topic, right? Um, let me shortly introduce myself. I'm myself, uh, I'm a part of a member committee of sustainability in the water sector who is the organizer of this uh, uh, webinar and uh, I have 10 years of experience in water in Ukraine and also in Africa uh, as well as I participate in the Young Water Professionals Steering Committee at this moment and our other activities of IWA. I'm happy to uh, moder moderate this webinar with my colleague Arlinda Ibrahimlari. Uh, she is also a member of uh, sustainable sustainability in the water sector um, specialist group, uh, as well as uh, uh, she had um, has already very big experience when it was International Water Association, being a lead of young water professionals for many years, as well like as a lead of SDGs uh, task force group. And currently she works as a consultant for UK consulting company in uh, Albania, focusing on capacity development and project management for water utilities. Mm, next slide, please. Uh, let me stop a bit on the logistics of this webinar. So this webinar is uh, available in two languages, English and Portuguese. Um, we would like to ask you to pick the language that you would like to hear, and you can find uh, it on the controls uh, with the tab interpretation. So if you click the uh, on the language, what you would like to hear, you will be able to do that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, just would like to mention that this webinar will be recorded and made available on the demand on the IWA website. Uh, and as well, like the materials like uh, like presentation slides or other information. The speakers uh, are responsible for securing copyright permissions for any work that they will present of, of this. They are not legal copyright holders. And uh, also the, the speakers uh, are the sole, uh, hold the, the sole responsibility on the materials, uh, what they um, include into the presentation and it's not necessarily reflect IWA opinion. Next slide, please. Uh, you'll be able to give Q, uh, qu your questions to the um, speakers. Yeah, please use Q&A box uh, for that. And we'll appreciate if you can add the name of the speaker to whom you would like to add this question. As well, the chat box will be available, but it's more like for uh, organizational things or any other questions what you have. Uh, next slide, please. Um, let me say a few words about our specialist group on sustainability in the water sector. So uh, we, mm, we try to uh, open different aspects of wa water and water use, not only technical and uh, economic, but also social and environmental um, uh, values of it. And uh, how can we uh, preserve this uh, water with different aspects for the future generations and all co-residents uh, co on our planet. You can find our group and more information about us on the IWA Connect Plus uh, if you use this link mentioned uh, on the slide, so it will be easy for you to find us. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, our our specialist group has four main pillars what we work on. It's sustainable use of water by industry, sustainable development goals, the digital water, and professional development and training. Uh, and uh, current webinar today more likely goes under the sustainable development goals direction of our 
work. Just uh, for your information, we also quite uh, active working on the topic on uh, uh, gender equality and women in powering in water. So before we had already a series uh, of webinars in uh, international and in a few regions uh, of the world, as well as a workshop on World Water Congress and exhibition in Denmark, um, sorry, in, yeah, in Denmark last year. Um, let's talk a bit, a bit about the topic of the webinar. Uh, it is well known that the that uh, today the world is facing uh, different issues and challenges. For example, like uh, access to clean water, poverty, hunger, inequality, climate change, change. It is just uh, some issues uh, that are needed to be addressed urgently. And uh, big challenges require bold action to overcome them. Uh, that is where the sustainable development uh, goals come in. Uh, overall, this um, sustainable development goals is a plan uh, agreed by all world leaders to build a greener, fairer, uh, better world by 2023. And all of us uh, should have a role to achieve in them. And as well, no one should be left behind. Uh, the so-called linear economy, uh, where resources become uh, a waste once used or consumed, has distanced us from the nature and bring uh, brings us even more challenges in the modern world. For indigenous people, uh, their way of life itself is uh, kind of sustainable. They feel connected with nature and feel like they are part of the system in which they live. Indigenous community have internalized the idea that if they exhaust the resources, uh, their children will have um, uh, nothing to eat. They will not have the place where to live. And the whole future gen generation uh, will, will have nothing. There is nothing, there will nothing left to, for this generation. Uh, also resources, for example, water has other important and valuable purpose for communities such as uh, spiritual or, or others. So indigenous people and sustainable development always go hand in hand. Beside that, indigenous people live in the most vulnerable ecosystems, ranging from circumpolar uh, Arctic to tropical rainforests, small islands, coastal areas, and all of the uh, territories where they live uh, faced by uh, current ecological crisis connected with climate change or, or for example, uh, decrease of water resources or loss of biodiversity. Let me say a few examples, like people in Asia uh, suffer from uh, sal salination of fresh water or intensification of monsoons or floodings. People in Africa has decrease of rainfall uh, rainfall amount or intensive drought so the, the the challenges are various so and despite these hostile life conditions indigenous peoples have managed to survive in these circumstances always finding ways to resist and adapt to environmental changes uh, mainly due to their deep knowledge and relationship with the environment the practice of sustainable traditional livelihood is a testimony of the resilience of indigenous people and their contribution to mitigate the impact of climate change. Overall, the sustainable development goals included specific mention of indigenous peoples and acknowledge that there can be no truly sustainable development without protecting the traditional knowledge and territories of indigenous people. Also, uh, indigenous knowledge systems are being recognized and inherently encompassing more aspects and principles of SDGs. The focus of today's webinar will be more like on water industry and water resources. However, uh, water is a part of uh, all aspects of our life. I believe ev everyone can agree that it is a part of the health, it is a part of uh, our environment, it is a part of our food or like agriculture, etc., etc. <laughs> As well as it's not only touched like SDG 6, but uh, it is cross-cutting with the majority of uh, SDGs. Uh, so today you will be able to hear different examples, starting with uh, applying SDGs for corporate sustainability in Denmark, 
as well as experiences from different indigenous community from Australia, Canada and Brazil and their perspective to achieving SDGs. Today, uh, as I already mentioned, we will be having like experiences from different countries, uh, starting from Denmark, Australia, Canada and Brazil. So first panel uh, will be uh, uh, will be started with our first speaker. Can we please have our next uh, slide? It is uh, Troy Beer. He works for water utility in Denmark. In his strategic planning work as uh, VCS Denmark, he and his colleagues looked at the links between the water services they provide and all SDGs go in the order to decide which of the SDG goals their utility would focus on. Trolls is a member of the management committee of uh, IWA specialist uh, group on sustainability in the water sector. Um, he's our colleague and he's also author of an article in the book recently published by International Water Association on sustainable use of water in the uh, water by industry. Um, Charles, I think it will be really great to hear your experiences, uh, how SDGs can be applied uh, for corporate sustainability and uh, uh, to open, how, how, how did you open different aspects of uh, uh, water in, uh, within your company? Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, we are happy to introduce our next speaker. It's uh, Bradley Modridge. He's associate professor and is proud Muri from the Kaminol Roy nation living in Ngunaval land. Also, he's researcher in indigenous water science with qualification in hydrogeology and environmental science. Until 2021, he was the indigenous liaison officer for the Triton Species Recovery Hub uh, under the National Environmental Science Program. He's a board member with the NSW IPA and Biodiversity uh, Council, uh, and also a member of the West Wars Group uh, of Concerned Scientists. Today, he will be speaking on indigenous water values and knowledge, water back. Um, Bradley, we're happy to hear from you. The floor is yours. Hey everyone. Um, my name is Brad Mogridge, currently a professor at the University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, I'm going to talk about an Australian perspective, Indigenous water values and knowledge and hashtag water back. So this is some, as I mentioned, some experiences from Australia. Just want to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people and their country, which I live on today uh, in Canberra. Uh, and you can sort of see there, my, my country is Kamilaroi, and these are some of my ancestors um, and obviously generations that are alive and have passed on. Um, that's uh, my four generations there on the left. You can see my uh, grandmother. She lived to a ripe old age of 96, and my mom and my son, and my son's now... 20 so he's a lot bigger than that and then there's an old photo you can see there in sepia and my nan's um, father is the young fella with the overalls and the hat the tall one and behind him are my nan's grandparents so very lucky to have that old photo uh, that's definitely 1800s and part of the frontier definitely look talk about the cultural value of water you know it's in our it's definitely in our in our law in our songs, our dances and our dreamings, our stories and of course our art, Aboriginal art is, is well renowned, um, especially, you know, you can see there on the right, the dot art, a lot of those circles, uh, the snake is the serpent and also um, part of my totemic system, uh, the carpet snake um, or carpet python and those circles are water holes where it, it moves between the surface and the underground. So what I'm trying to do is think of traditional knowledge uh, water knowledge itself is is through acknowledging our diversity. We're not all the same. Uh, get back to how our old people knew water, tell our stories our way about water, build in Indigenous research methodologies in the way we do things, 
and bring the rights and values of water. So aiming to decolonize water and also decolonize water law because it's very complex and it very much benefits the settler. And they get to a point where we can culturally valid validate and it's accepted by the academies uh, and validate that knowledge. So I was talking about diversity before. This is why, because we're all different. You can see, you know, the, the many different uh, language groups here on this map, um, which shows, you know, the, obviously the language groups themselves, different laws, customs, landscapes, cultural practice, also our capacity and status and governance, how we exist in the in a modern day context. Water and first people are connected, but where is our water right? This is like a Water 101, yeah, what does history tell me? For us as Aboriginal people on, in Australia, land and water was given away. Our rivers were modified, over-extracted, polluted, diverted, stored. So they, they, there is way too much water being taken out of the system compared to what's being left in to keep the, our rivers alive and also um, recharge our groundwater systems. And then when you think about this, our people were not counted as humans until the late 1960s, there was a national referendum where it allowed Aboriginal people to be counted as part of the Australian population. Uh, so that's my mum's generation. Um, I was born a human in the early 70s, so I'm very lucky, very privileged, uh, all the stuff they had to go through. So when we became human, uh, all the good land and water was gone and there was nothing left, so we were left with the crap. Um, that no one else wanted, sadly. And the water itself, um, as I mentioned, was yeah, was heavily modified. So now if we want water, we have to go to a water market and purchase it because um, land and water were decoupled in the early 2000s. And so there's two markets, land and water. And so if we want it, we've got to go to the market and buy it. So status of drinking water, um, you know, this is a, a big issue. It's uh, for Aboriginal people, especially in regional and remote communities. Um, you know, there's there's a there's a report done by Water Services Association Australia. You know, it looked at 500 remote Indigenous communities and most of them don't have tested water, let alone safe water to drink. So, you know, it's their report was called Closing the Water or pe Closing for Water and people and communities gap, improving water services to First Nations remote communities. Um, across 15 case studies, approximately 2.2 billion to fix and ensure Indigenous people are engaged. Although that this isn't a new concept, this has been around for a while. Uh, I was part of a, a team that wrote a conversation piece uh, looking at countless reports showing water is undrinkable in many Indigenous communities. Why has nothing changed? Why has this recent um, WSAA report got traction, whereas other reports haven't? So, and I suppose in our conversation piece, we looked at four broad issues: um, physical, technical, financial, and so, and as well as social and governance. Um, and they were explained in our conversation piece. And I suppose our the world doesn't actually know Australian Indigenous people's predicament with regards to water. And I suppose the other thing is how can Australia meet its SDG 6 with all these issues in remote Aboriginal communities? A way forward, where we know that water is a basic human right, is responsibility of water service providers and the industry advocates to step up and walk, walk it. Not just talk, not just not just talk it, but actually walk it. Um, so deliver, and then obviously collaborate with communities and making sure they're they're actually as part of the the system. Research must be indigenous led and co-designed throughout the process. Uh, we're tired of non-indigenous people um, entering the space and taking taking indigenous knowledge for granted, um, and obviously getting their getting their own way with our knowledge. So. It's also, it's also us, up to us as Indigenous people to, to actually access that. Delivery programs must also be Indigenous-led and co-designed throughout the process from start to finish and even monitoring into the future um, and must be culturally appropriate. Funding and resources must be adequate for the job at hand. I know the Australian government, after the WSAA report come out, they committed $150 million when uh, it was reported that 
2.2 billion was required. So yeah, the rights to water and water sharing must be decolonized. Um, as currently it is only a benefit the settler, as I mentioned before. So water back is is our fight. Um, and rematriate water is a new word that is as has popped up in the water space, looking at women's roles in water. And um, you know, I was part of a paper with 17 or 18 other Indigenous water scholars, and we produced that paper there with a link there. And it's um, you know, rematriate water was a key part of that. That'll do me, and obviously that is my contact, and you'll see there my beard growing and definitely grew solid through COVID. Thank you, and see you next time. It's a pleasure to introduce our next speaker. It's Isaac Piaco. Uh, he's great leader of Ashaninka Indigenous People. He was the first teacher of his people and the first Indigenous uh, mayor of the Amazonian state of Acre in Brazil. Currently, he is health coordinator of the Jurua River District, and today he will be speaking uh, and sharing experiences of his uh, indigenous community uh, in terms of challenges, what they have, the solutions uh, based on the knowledge and um, values of Ashaninka community, and as well... Um, different aspects of water what community may have uh, it's very interesting to hear about that and uh, Isaac the floor is yours então eu sou Isaac Bianco sou do povo Xaninka trabalhei bastante como professor na terra indígena Campa do Rio Amônia fui prefeito de Marechal Tamatugo por 12 mandatos e hoje estou sendo coordenador do Diceio do Alto Rio Juruá aqui na região do Alto Juruá, que são abrange oito municípios, uma população de 20 mil indígenas e 14 povos. Então, nessa o povo Xaninca ali do Rio Amônia, é, nós temos assim uma uma história muito forte, sagrada com com a água. Né? Assim como todos os componentes da natureza, a água é uma das, das coisas mais importantes que nós temos. É, sabemos que a tradição indígena não é só a água para beber, mas também uma relação espiritual que nós temos com as águas. Né? É, é, muitos pajés, muitas né, pessoas que, que lutam com o mundo espiritual sempre aconselha a importância da, da água para o uso no dia a dia. Né? Então, a gente usa a água para beber, para cozinhar, para as crianças se divertir né, no seu dia a dia, tomar banho. Então, é um mundo de liberdade é, é muito grande. Né? E quando isso se perde, nós, o povo Xaninca, é, sentimos muito com isso. Inclusive, agora, nos últimos anos, é, a seca prolongada nessa região, né, nós sentimos muito. É, e, com certeza, o povo Xaninca é, está sofrendo é, com, essa, com essa seca prolongada, né, o descontrole é, climático da, né, da, dessa região, e acredito que isso também é do planeta. Né? Nessa região também, é, é, não só o, o povo Xaninca, como os outros povos também, assim também como a reserva extrativista do Alto Juruá, ali que fica naquela fronteira, né? a, a fronteira com o Brasil, com o Peru, é onde localiza, está localizado o nosso território, e muitos rios ele, eles, é, nascem no Peru e vem para o Brasil. Então, nós temos muita dificuldade também hoje com essa questão da poluição das águas, né? dos rios, da, das nascentes. Né? E na reserva extrativista, é, ali por ser um território muito grande, também nós estamos sofrendo com essa questão do desmate né? das nascentes, das fontes é, de água, 
E isso influencia, porque não é só a água em si, mas todo o ciclo de vida daquela, daquela região, dessa região, a gente sente que cada ano que passa acelera a mudança. Né? Nessa região, é, é, nós trabalhamos aqui é, com poços, com poços é, é, artesianos para poder suprir a nossa necessidade, mas a gente percebe que o subsolo nosso, é, quando a gente chega numa média de, de 30, 40, 50 é, metros de profundidade, é, nós temos só água salgada nessa região. Então, a população é, dessa região precisa imediatamente uma atenção, né? um investimento dos governos, porque hoje, é, quando se fala da Amazônia, nós não estamos falando só de, de alguns países, nós estamos falando do planeta. Né? E aqui nessa região... É, é, nós precisamos, sim, imediatamente é, buscar uma forma de, de, de preservar, é, desenvolver tecnologia e proteger né, as nascentes e as fontes de água que temos nessa, nessa região, através do rio, né, porque nós sabemos que as grandes influências é, é, industrial ou, ou alguns produtos, algumas matérias, materiais, é, produtos que chegam nessa região, é, eles acabam atingindo fortemente, é, é, principalmente sacolas, plástica, é, garrafa PET, e, enfim, outros outros é, investimentos que chegam nessa região, que muitas das vezes os governos municipais e estaduais eles não dão importância para isso, mas a gente precisa fortemente é, desenvolver e trabalhar essa questão da água. Próximo. É, nós fizemos um, um trabalho é, também com a, em parceria, é, quando eu estava na prefeitura, em parceria é, com outras instituições, é, governo do Estado, governo federal, é, de trabalhar um, um, um sistema de abastecimento é, de água na Vila Restauração. E na Vila Restauração, a gente é, é, planejou na época... É, que a Vila Restauração ela fica dentro da reserva extrativista. E ali mora ali basicamente 300 famílias. né? E, e até hoje, na Vila Restauração, não tem um sistema de esgoto, é, um sistema de abastecimento de água adequado para essa população. Então, a gente percebe que é uma população altamente rica, né? que guarda consigo as histórias, o conhecimento da biodiversidade, a relação da água também é muito forte e precisa da água no dia a dia para o serviço. Então, nós fizemos o um investimento lá, está sendo finalizado o investimento, mas não é, não, não é ainda o necessário, né? porque não é só o sistema de abastecimento de água, mas como colocar essa água que foi... É, é, encanada na, nas casas e como fazer o análise dela para que essa população, de fato, tenha um, uma água de qualidade no meio da floresta, que muitas pessoas, às vezes, imaginam no meio da floresta, lá tem rio, tem, tem, tem tudo, mas é, é aqui que se a, a água ela se contamina muito mais rápido, é, caso houver uma seca, um desastre ou assoreamento da, dos rios, é, nós vamos ter um problema seríssimo com essa população, que não é só a água, como eu falei, mas a, a proteção, o fortalecimento dessas pessoas que aqui vivem e que sempre viveram aqui nessa região amazônica, dentro de, um, de uma imensidão, de uma floresta tão grande. Então, é isso, é, é, a minha apresentação, viu? É um prazer apresentar nosso próximo speaker, do Canadá. Her name is Dawn uh, Marlin Hill. Uh, she is Mohawk and resides at Six Nations with her family. She was the first indigenous cultural anthropologist in Canada and continues to break barriers in education and research. She founded the Indigenous Studies program at McMaster University. And uh, her primary research over three decades is working with community 
women, environment, and development capacity with youth. Her current research includes how do Nozanoi uh, access to clean water, traditional ecological knowledge, and creating bilingual tools to increase capacity in water monitoring in her community of Six Nations and Lubicon Cree in Alberta. She was recently a recipient of the Oklahoma University Water Technologies Award, and uh, her specific research interest is in traditional knowledge naturally highlights solutions in improving quality of life through attention to gender, governance, and well-being related to water quality. Um, so, Don, I uh, believe it will be very interesting for people to get to know what does it mean to be first Indigenous cultural anthropologist in Canada. Uh, what uh, issues it um, somehow may help to resolve for your Indigenous community or neighboring Indigenous community, or what approaches from uh, those communities you can suggest to uh, be used for achieving SDGs. And uh, yeah, SDGs not only uh, SDG 6, but overall, I believe you've been working on uh, uh, some inequalities, uh, gender equality, or like even health well-being. So it will be great to hear from you. The floor is yours. Hi, I'm happy to be here. My name is Don Martin Hill. I am a cultural anthropologist uh, at McMaster University Indigenous Studies Department. And I'm also the PI for the co-creation of Indigenous Water Quality Tools, a global water uh, futures research uh, grant. We have several and the community has rebranded our research um, under Oneganos. Uh, which is just water, and, and you'll you'll see why that word resonates with our community. Um, so I'd like to talk a bit about the work that we do. A good path is something um, we talked about with our elders, uh, knowledge holders, um, who wanted us to bring together scholars, community, local experts, uh, water treatment plant operators, uh, everybody to look at how we can best improve uh, management and monitoring of our water underwater governance and developing strategies that would advocate for indigenous rights, our health and community led dis uh, solutions. This required um, a lot of conversations over a year, but the idea was to create tools that would be useful to the community, to education, knowledge mobilization, and also to be able to advance the agenda uh, on priorities of conserving our aquifer water and conserving uh, um, the water that we do have uh, control over, which is very, very little. Um, so I just like to say that we created a, a cache of digital stories with student community members, looking at water teachings from a traditional ecological knowledge. This is all part of capacity development, uh, accrediting uh, high school students who work on the project, who have done some of the mapping, participatory mapping, uh, GIS, water monitoring, and creating a portal or a platform that would be easily accessible to schools, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, um, to be a, a tool for training and creating new educational opportunities and pathways for our community to get involved more heavily in ecosystems and environmental sciences. Um, we have a lot to offer. During COVID, one of the ways that we pivoted and adapted our research, which was community engaged at all phases, was to create a podcast. That podcast was led by my daughter because she was stuck at home with me as a university student and had already worked on Onigonos. And with uh, grad students at McMaster, um, Hannah and Catherine, um, who were excited to learn how to operate <clears throat> engineering soundboards, how to create um, podcast material, secure um, knowledge holders, elders, community activists, artists, um, pulling together all the um, knowledge that exists around water and having really great conversations 
about ways that we can decolonize our sciences, decolonize Indigenous research, so that we can advance Indigenous resiliency and, and achieve you know, sustainable development goal six, to be able to manage and monitor our water and have authority over those water bodies. It actually ended up winning um, uh, David Suzuki People's Choice Ground Up Award, which um, we had set out to make two. We ended up making 30. Those are all available on our websites. So the warrior science model is really about actualizing and action oriented research. Um, we don't have time to be intellectualizing, you know, Western theories and indigenous theories and all of the kind of ivory tower business that happens. We need to hit the ground running. We need to take the best of both worlds so that we can create ways that we can mitigate climate change and protect our water sources. And so that protection order is really where the warrior science model comes from. We also wanted to not create new um, <laughs> burdens, if you will, for the community, but to adapt our research to things the community is already doing, support those activities, support those young people, support um, land-based and water-based um, activities, and just maybe add some more um, uh, areas of interest to those activities, such as, you know, uh, creating digital stories about the Grand River, the journey down the Grand River, acknowledging the history, uh, settler history, as well as our history with the two-row uh, wampum belt or the Gaswenta. Uh, so we're really mobilizing both Indigenous and non-Indigenous neighbors because we all need to care about our water. And that's something that the elders and knowledge holders really imparted on us was we need everybody to care as deeply about the water as our people do. And that's how we can achieve some of these goals. So we've looked at ways that we can respond to reconciliation. Um, we've published a number of articles and chapters um, highlighting how to do this methodology, how to do community-driven, indigenous knowledge-led, um, actualized warrior science, if you will, and have our colleagues at university who often have never uh, worked with indigenous people, but they have an expertise we need, how to engage them in a way that's helpful and not harmful to our people. Um, and so there's a lot of work that goes into uh, assisting our colleagues at the university and finding ways to engage with our community that our protocols are in place, that there are principles in place and cultural training. So we've done a lot of work to nurture uh, traditional ecological knowledge and Western science engagement within an indigenous pedagogy of practice and framework. And we found this to be a really successful model, challenging, um, <laughs> time consuming. One of the things the knowledge guardians, <clears throat> when I asked them, how do we um, roll out all of the information? Because we've got many teams, we've got mental health teams, we've got health teams, um, maternal health, we have youth. Um, we also have a number of surveys that were happening, water sensors, developing, monitoring um, technologies, apps, et cetera digital mapping, how do we roll this out in a way that's meaningful to community uh, and will mobilize the knowledge that that has been accumulated? And they identified a virtual reality, which shocked us a little bit um, because they have grandchildren and so on who are, you know, really into gaming and, and VR. And they said, we want all children, all public schools in Canada and the neighboring uh, communities to not just learn about the history of our people, our knowledge of place, our, our understanding and value of water, but we want to share that um, deep regard and responsibility towards water. And the only way they thought to do that was through virtual reality or some interaction components rather than just like videos or pamphlets. So we started on a journey of creating a VR with Mohawk College. I'm gonna share just a small sample of that with you, um, but but it is a, a passion project um, that we didn't expect to do. A long time ago, 
our people lived in Sky World. We call them Sky People, and Sky World was a place of everlasting life. In Sky World stood a shining celestial tree that resembled a wild cherry. This is the tree of life. Sky Woman lived in this place. Her name was Ojitzizo, which means mature flower. Her uncle was Rade Zerunjes, Sky Chief. He is the overseer of the heavens. One day he asked Sky Woman to go get water. He asked her to make three trips. He told her not to stop and not to speak to anyone. On her third trip, she met a lacrosse player and he asked her if she would give him a drink. The Sky Chief learned that she disobeyed him. He was upset with a lacrosse player and banished him from Sky World. But he forgave Sky Woman. Sky Woman had a craving for a root, and she asked Sky Chief to dig some of the roots up for her. He dug a hole at the base of the Tree of Life, which caused it to be uprooted. Sky Woman was curious and looked into the hole, and when she did, she fell into the hole. As she fell, she grabbed strawberries. So as you can see, we started out with um, Sky World because that's what the Knowledge Guardians thought was the first time we talk about water. And in fact, um, we cut it off there due to our time restrictions here. But her first words uh, upon seeing Earth and settling on a, a turtle's back was, um, it's all water or onigonos. So I think the, the understanding is that water was here before humans and water will be here after humans, um, that we are a species along with all the other animals in creation, no greater than nor less than. And I think it's those principles that they wanted to impart. But we also show in, in the VR how to test water. Uh, we have some of our science findings. We also have uh, climate change um, information that you know, will become the gaming component um, so we don't disempower people, but encourage them to take responsibility and get involved with learning and monitoring and managing or being responsible as, as outlined, outlined in our teachings about water. Much of the material, our peer reviewed publications, our community publications, all of our updates on our research and research findings can be found on our website along with our social media, which is very active because we engage youth. Um, our, we also have a YouTube channel. We transferred all of our podcast and digital stories into one space so they're easier to find. And you're welcome to use or utilize any of these um, uh, materials because they're meant for the public. And thank you for asking me a to be a part of this panel. I look forward to uh, further working with IWA and being supportive of the work that they're doing around water. Nyawe Danito. Thank you very much, Dan, for this for your presentation. And I believe yeah, we have different parts of history. And uh, yeah, we cannot change what happened previously, right? But at least we are working on, on improving our present and future that is actually yeah like uh, all of us should be involved in the achieving of this uh, SDGs not only SDG 6 but all, all over like including equalities right as I told, told told and yeah due to our work it's we also no one also has to be left behind so hopefully we will all together with a common effort will achieve that. Uh, so now we will move to the um, Q and A. Uh, and I've seen there is a there is a question uh, in the, the chat uh, Q and A box. 
Yeah, per perhaps the first question is for Isaac, if he can answer uh, to that. Um, the translator, make sure to translate the question. Um, it's about his experience in this spiritual connection um, uh, of us with water resources. The um, attendee asks Naloiso, it asks that it seems that now most of our water resources are polluted, making it difficult for use for spiritual purposes and connecting with water spiritually. What are some of the implications for um, spiritual users? And because he uh, touched upon, Isaac touched upon the spiritual meaning of water, maybe he can uh, give his perspective on this. It's more on a cultural uh, aspect. Yes, we know that is very que toda as questões de financiamento é, de uma água saudável de né, desse novo é, da questão do de água tratada, sistema de abastecimento de água, é, toda a política é, está na mão do, do Né, dos governantes, né, dos, dos governos. Nós, populações indígenas, é, a gente tem uma importância, uma significância muito grande da água. Por exemplo, como eu falei, que todos os nossos conhecimentos tradicionais, que eles são transmitidos de geração em geração, é, dos nossos antepassados, É, sobretudo essa questão espiritual. Nós, como a origem que, que mexe com as questões primárias é, e com as questões é, altamente tradicional, nós fizemos todo o esforço, ao longo das nossas milhares de vidas antepassado de manter uma conexão muito forte com a água com a natureza como todo. Mas, a, falando especificamente da água, os nossos antepassados, segundo ele, nós não podemos viver sem a água, e principalmente os donos da água. Os nossos anciões pajés, eles se relacionam muito forte espiritual, espiritualmente com o dono da água, que nós chamamos. E os donos da água, eles não nos oferecem também o conhecimento e as vidas, tanto da vida espiritual, como da vida medicinal, como da vida é, social, como da, a, da vida é, cultural como um todo. E isso é bem visível dentro de um território aonde a população é, vive tradicionalmente. E hoje, o que nos afeta hoje? A gente... Até imagina que ah, tá vivendo no meio da floresta, está tudo bem. Mas nós temos uma cobertura florestal. Dentro da cobertura florestal, nós temos os rios e temos também as, as fronteiras, os limites. Às vezes está do outro lado do, é, do outro lado do país, aonde o país tem um empreendimento. E os nossos rios por ficar no meio da Amazônia, no meio da floresta, a gente tem certeza de que os nossos rios eles não servem mais para a gente tomar banho e nem beber aquela água. Então, é muito triste a gente falar isso, mas que é uma realidade. Eu estou agora hoje no distrito e estou acompanhando todos os indicadores, né, as metas que o governo nos propõe para atingir com a questão da saúde indígena, a gente tem um dos maiores dos maior debates que nós vamos criar é sobre a água. Nesse momento, agora, eu saí de uma reunião para participar desse debate, de uma reunião de conselhos, onde está aqui toda a regional dessa, desse distrito que eu estou participando. Indígenas que vieram lá da aldeia. Daqui a pouco eu estou indo para lá e vou levar essa mensagem, vou passar para ele o que eu vi aqui dos demais palestrantes. É muito triste a gente... É, é, achar de que no meio da Amazônia está tudo bem, aí tem água, tem tudo. Mas aqui está sendo o um grande centro de poluição das águas. Né? Então, é muito triste a nossa população, por a gente ter preservado tanto o nosso território, 
por a gente ter feito tanta política, os nossos antepassados que já se foram, que já morreram, é, a gente hoje, como um, um jovem, como uma pessoa que está nessa luta, tudo aquilo que nossos antepassados lutaram, deixaram, e a gente não ter força para é, reverter essa situação. Então, é uma situação triste. É, ontem mesmo eu presenciei aqui na Praia de Cruzeiro do Sul as pessoas querendo, as pessoas não indígenas querendo é, usufruir de uma praia, estabelecer todo uma, um acampamento para brincar, jovens de 16, de 15, de 12, criança e tomando banho quase dentro do esgoto. Então é muito triste é, é, presenciar isso. Eu, depois dessa palestra, até pensei é, 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 em a gente coordenar e mostrar mesmo é, para o mundo o que está que acontecendo nos, com os rios da Amazônia, sobretudo dentro dos territórios indígenas. Então, é, 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 assim, a gente pede, é, é, até conversando com o Luiz, para que a gente possa... É, esse projeto que a gente fez da restauração, que ainda a gente está em busca de financiamento, é, seria basicamente é, é, um modelo demonstrativo né, para o governo é, também ter como base... É, essas iniciativas é, de modelo demonstrativo, aonde, mas não um modelo é, que possa colocar e, 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 e só ter água, não, mas um modelo que possa a ter sustentabilidade política né, a partir dali, aonde possa ter sustentabilidade política e financiamento para que essas populações é, 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 possam é, sobreviver. E política de... de, de de frear, né, o que está chegando é nesse território. Thank you, Isaac, for such a detailed response. Uh, we have a question about how how our speakers can see the term of water sovereignty. Maybe uh, Dawn can elaborate on that. Yeah, so Canada started a Canadian water agency. Um, I I mean, water moves. You know, water is more sentient being and is sovereign. Humans can't own water. Humans can't own water. So these concepts, again, from the West, don't, 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 um, they don't help um, people understand the issue, which is uh, we don't own water. We are reliant on water. So I think our great law cites that we are responsible. It is a responsibility to water. It is not something that you can own. So a sovereignty would be more under our control so that we could protect water, you know, similar to the places that gave personhood rights. I've been to New Zealand. I've worked with the people who did that. I asked our, our governance, our traditional leaders um, about this, and they kind of laughed and said water is so much more than a human being that that's sad um human beings rely on water so again it's this it's it's a philosophy that is is not matching but i would say if if people could respect if we could change the mindset of the world so that they understood this is your source of life this is without water you have no existence no future um, if, if the West could work hard to, you know, they do have good propaganda, um, films, movies, all kinds of media to, to really help change the mindset about how to treat and care for water and children have no connection to water, um, that something comes out of, they're so detached, um, that it's nothing to contaminate it. So we need to change the mindset and, and become sovereign thinkers on how to care for the water uh, rather than have water sovereignty. Yeah, absolutely. I think you are, you are correct. And it's uh, good to take into account different aspects of water and different aspects of life, right? And to make people be aware of, uh, of all of these things. Uh, uh, we still have some questions, but unfortunately we are running out of the time. So we will collect all of these questions and we will send to the speakers or IWA will say, send to the speakers. So we'll try to respond on that. Just few announcements on the future 
webinars what we will have uh, <clears throat> in the closest months. So uh, one of that will be in the beginning of the month on improving data systems for sanitation and another like on sustainable as to arena and uh, coastal development uh, as well. Uh, in the closest future, we will have uh, IWA Digital Water Summit in November in Spain and also uh, a very big event. What we also uh, planning to, uh, to prepare some of the uh, workshops on different thematics is like Water and Development Congress and Exhibition in uh, what will be in Rwanda in, in Kigali in December this year. So hopefully to meet you uh, all <laughs> there. Uh, uh, from my side, just to conclude, I just wanted to also to say like a support to that, that it's, it is uh, very important that if we will have proactive participation as an agent of change uh, for achievement of sustainable goal, specifically indigenous community. And I believe, uh, as it was mentioned and declared in uh, sustainable development goals, that uh, sustainable development is not possible without uh, taking into account uh, the uh, you know, protection of knowledge and protection of uh, uh, territories of indigenous people and uh, including that into the common agenda and in common approaches. I don't know if Arlinda want to add something for conclusion. Well, yeah, um, I started in the beginning saying that it uh, needs hours to talk about this topic is so large and so big, but uh, thank you for, um, from all, uh, of all of us, the organizing team to the speakers who have been so open and um, they shared so widely all the challenges. Thank you, Dawn, for being so sincere and when trying to also compare um, oil projects, the oil pipeline project with what is also missing in terms of funding and uh, allocation of um, financial um, aids for those communities. Thank you, Isaac, being the, may uh, the first mayor, indigenous first mayor in Brazil. Thank you for taking the time, leaving the other meetings out and being present with us. Thank you, Bradley, Professor Associate Bradley, for uh, not only sharing your story, but with all the comments that you gave an answer to the q and I just realized and found that you are probably one of the best mentors we can have to um, showcase uh, your work, but also the indigenous community uh, experience to the new generation. Uh, indigenous or non-indigenous also mentioned by Dawn. Um, thank you, uh, Troels, for also mentioning that water is not alone it's not just water it's only water is it's everywhere so it's not just sdg6 it's it's all about the SDGs. i really hope that this event um had contributed just a bit just a bit in reducing the lack of understanding about the indigenous people practices and knowledge uh, among decision makers and the, uh, the science community which implies the need for um greater um uh, governmental engagement in understanding and incorporating the indigenous knowledge um, in water management and government uh, governmental policies. Uh, I hope that this was a call, or at least, yeah, a start of a call for recognition, the rights um, of all the stakeholders, especially in the international arena, in IWA. We're gonna have next year in Canada, Toronto, the International um, um, Congress, Water Congress there, and I'm pretty sure that the indigenous perspectives will take the, the biggest part of the, of the program. But um, this is a, a start for us, um, especially for this specialist group. And we hope to continue our work. Um, again, I'm thankful for all of you taking your time and being present with us. It means a lot, not only for participants here today, but for everyone who will have the chance to listen to this recorded webinar on the IWA website. Thank you again. Ludmila, um, I think we are um, just in the last call for new members or people who want to join in uh, IWA. Uh, we're going to provide you today a 20% discount off with the code. Um, take a picture of the code uh, on the slide so you can um, join us. Uh, and become a member of IWA. Thank you very much to all of you who attended and hope to see you soon.